There aren't too many things more sobering uh, to reflect on than what we've just spent the last few minutes thinking about, the ways that for better and for worse, the people that we've become, we've become because of the investments made in us by the people who loved us and raised us. In a sense, we joke and we say that, you know, the only thing certain in life are death and taxes. I think we should say three things are certain in life, death, taxes, and that you will look yourself in the mirror one day and say, my goodness, I've become my mother. <laughs> You'll hear those words come out of your mouth and you think, oh man, I sound just like my dad. We eventually become what we experienced growing up if we don't consciously rebel and push it all away. And as sobering as that is, probably the only thing more sobering to think about is the fact that that's true of the next generation too. That the kids that we care about, as parents and caregivers and uncles and aunts and so on, those kids will become what we have invested in them, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And that's why for the last three weeks of the school year, the family ministry is taking us through a series called Crowded Table, where we are thinking about the ways that we as families and as a community are raising up the next generation, because there is nothing more anxiety inducing than thinking about the fact that my kids are going to become what I shape them to become by and large. And that anxiety, as those who are parents know, begins early, even before they're born. With questions like, you know, should we co-sleep? Should we schedule? Should we vaccinate? Should we bottle feed? Right? And the questions, they don't go away as the kids get older. Mine are between 11 and 15. And it's questions about how do I know what's going on in their friend group? How, what's the best way to discipline? How do I monitor, you know, uh, their screen time and their TV time? And how do I keep them safe online? How do I have conversations with them about the important things, drugs and sex and whatever else the conversations may be? And as much anxiety as there, as there is in all of that, there is a whole community of people, books and, and mommy blogs and parenting podcasts and friends and families and mentors who are all prepared to provide wildly contradictory advice about the best way to parent your kids. And then for those of us who bring a faith component to the question, there's another layer of anxiety. Am I doing it God's way? I want to do it the biblical way. And usually what we mean by that is I want to do it the foolproof way. What the Bible says so that if I do all the right things now, my kids are going to turn out all right later. Like it says in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, train children in the way they should go. When they grow old, they won't depart from it. That's what we want. We want to know that if we make all the right decisions now, our kids are going to be all right later. And there's just a couple of problems with that. The first is that this verse is not a promise. It's a proverb. A promise says, if you do this, that is guaranteed to happen. A proverb is like a rule of thumb, an observation. It says, when people do this, Oftentimes it works out like that, but it's not a promise. And there are some people who are listening this morning who know that, who before God, as best as you knew how, you tried to train your kids in the way that they should go. And now that they're old, some of them are departing from it. And maybe the only thing, if you're in that space this morning, the only thing you need to hear and take away this morning is this. It's not your fault. It just isn't. The guilt and the shame that you pile on yourself when you think about how your kid is doing or the judgment that you feel from other people whose kids turned out better, none of that, you deserve none of that. It's not your fault. That in as much as our kids become what we invest in them, our kids also have to choose to embrace it for themselves. And I hope and I pray that your response, if that's the situation you're in, that your response is twofold this morning. Number one, that you would 
in an act of self-compassion, release yourself from the guilt and the shame and ignore whatever judgment you feel. And secondly, that you would remember that the story isn't over yet. The story for your kid hasn't been totally written yet. And just lean into God's grace. The other challenge about that approach, if I do all the right things now, my kids will turn all all right later, is that when you turn to the Bible to discover all the right things, you discover that the Bible actually isn't much of a parenting manual at all. There aren't that many tips and tricks and techniques for raising your kids the right way. And when you do find them, they're not always helpful. Proverbs 13 says, those who withhold the rod hate their children, but the one who loves them applies discipline. The Bible says, if you don't hit your kid with sticks, you hate them. Um, That's not true. And don't obey that saying in the Bible. I mean, at the end of the day, the proverb is about the importance of discipline. And yes, we believe that. And it describes discipline as they thought about it 3,000 years ago, but that's not super helpful. I believe in discipline. That doesn't tell me much about how to discipline my kids well today. So the, the anxiety kind of endures because I want to raise my kids the right way. I want to do all the right things so they turn out all right. And, and, and the Bible and my community don't always necessarily give me much help with that. But here's what the Bible does give. And what I want to share about raising the, the next generations, the kids that we love as parents and caregivers and invested adults, the Bible doesn't, may not give tips and tricks and techniques the way we wish, but it does give a vision for what it's about. And at the end of the day, God wants for your kids pretty much what you want for your kids. I often talk about the, well, I haven't often talked about it. I talked to a friend recently about this nice vision of parenting, right? Which is, I want to raise nice kids who marry nice kids and have nice kids and get a nice job and live a nice life, right? That's sort of the, the cliched version of the nice life we hope for for our kids. And while our kids don't check all those boxes and shouldn't even necessarily, God wants something similar for our kids, It says in Deuteronomy 6, verse 3, listen to my commandments, Israel. Follow them carefully. Why? So that things will go well for you. And so that you'll continue to multiply exactly as the Lord, your ancestors, God promised you in a land full of milk and honey. God says, here's what I want for you. I want things to go well for you. If you want a family, I want you to have a family. If you, I want you to be a part of a growing community of vibrancy and faith, people who love God and love me. I want you to experience the fullness and the abundance that is available through Jesus. That's what I want for you. And that's what I want for your kids. And here's how God says it. He says, listen to my commandments so that... Here's what it says the verse before. Here's how we experience God's blessing. Put ourselves in a position to have things go well for us. It says, fear the Lord your God by keeping all God's regulations and God's commandments that I'm commanding you today, both you and your sons and daughters, your kids, all the days of your life so that it will lengthen your life. God says, here's how it goes the best for you. Fear God and obey God's commandments. That's it. That's the heart of it. I should clarify, when it says fear God, what God doesn't mean is be afraid of God. Be afraid of God's wrath. Be afraid of God's punishment that if you screw up in the least, God is going to let you have it. Mm -mm. Uh, That kind of fear has no place in the gospel, in the Christian life. In the New Testament, it says that God is love and anyone who lives in the love of God, that love drives out the fear of punishment. The fear of punishment has nothing to do with living in a relationship with God. What fear the Lord means is be overwhelmed by the goodness and greatness of God in such a way that you want to obey God every moment of your life. That's how you set yourself up to experience God's best and for your kids to experience God's best. And so what is the commandment that we're supposed to obey and teach our kids to obey if we want them to experience God's best? Verse 5 tells us, 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your being, and all your strength. These words I'm commanding you today must always be on your minds. Moses says this, God wants life to go well for you. God wants you to belong to a vibrant community of love and faith. God wants you to experience the fullness and abundance of life. And here's how to experience it. By getting such a clear picture of the goodness and greatness of God that you want to give your whole life to loving God with everything you have and everything you are. It says with all your heart, that's sort of the inner energy and intensity. It says every thought of every day, every moment of every day should be single-mindedly focused on loving God as hard as you can. It says we're to love God with all of our being, all of our embodied life, with all of our passion and with all of our energy every day of our life until we draw the last breath. It says we're to love God with all of our strength, the word in Hebrew just means all of our muchness, with all of the muchness that you have, all of the time you have, all of the money that you have, all of the positions and the possessions that you have, all of the influence that you have. Love God with your business. Love God with your education. Love God with your career. Love God with your parenting. Love God with the way you invest in the next generation. Love God in the way you participate in the community of faith. Love God with all the muchness that you have. Because if we, as parents and caregivers and adults who care about the next generation, if we pour ourselves into that, into loving God as hard as we can with all that we have and all that we are, our kids will catch that from us. There was a study done recently it said that one of the greatest predictors for a boy of their adulthood spirituality is how passionately their dad sang in church on a Sunday morning. Right? The whole point is that if a boy is going to grow up to be a man that passionately loves God, one of the greatest indicators of that likelihood is that they had a dad who passionately loved God in the way that he sang on Sunday mornings. It's not a guarantee, obviously. There are no guarantees. There are no recipes. But it gives your kid the chance to catch your passionate love for God. They will catch that from us much more than anything we teach, that their love for God, that will set them up for things to go well for them and to experience community of vibrancy of faith and love, for them to experience the fullness and abundance of the life of God's blessing. They, their experience of the love of God that creates that hope for them is something they catch from us or they don't. I had a friend in university, his name's John Butt, and yes, it's Butt, and yes, he's heard all the jokes. And John didn't come to church a lot with me in university, and so finally I asked him one day, I said, why do you never come? And he hummed and hawed for a long time, and finally he said to me very poignantly, well, he said, growing up, my dad didn't seem to need the church, so I guess I don't think I need it either. And that's the point. To set your kids up for the best life they can experience. We need to invite them into a, love, into a life of loving God as hard as they can with all that they are and all that they have. And the best way for us to invite them into that is for them to catch it from us. Now, it's not something that's just caught. It is taught. It goes on in Deuteronomy to say, recite these things to your children. Talk about them when you're sitting down around your house and when you get are up and out, out and about. When you're lying down and when you're getting up, tie them on your hand as a sign. They should be on your forehead as a symbol. The, the writer of Deuteronomy says this isn't something that the kids just see. It's something that they you talk to them about, recite to them what the scriptures say about a life of loving God and loving people. Recite the commandments, recite the stories. Notice that it says recite. In order to talk to your kids about it, you need to know about it too. 
Pour your life into the scriptures so that you can share them with your kids. Tell your kids your stories of obeying God and who you became and, or when you disobeyed God and what had happened after that. It's something we talk about proactively all the time, but it's something we talk about reactively too. Krista and I, we don't shelter our kids. That's just a choice that we've made. We introduce them to things in age-appropriate ways, but we let them experience what's out in the world because we've committed to debriefing everything with them. Asking, what did you hear on Sunday? What did you hear at Riot? What did you hear in Current? What did you hear from your friends? What did you hear at your friend's house? What did you hear at school? What did you hear online? What did you hear on TV? We talk to them all the time about what we're ex they're experiencing so that we can teach them how to live a life biblically in the world in which they live. Teach them how to love God and to love people in all of those circumstances and in response to everything they've seen. We do it proactively. We do it reactively. I think we need to do it creatively. The text says, tie it on your wrist or on your forehead, right? If I, if I put something on my forehead, if I put on a Dallas Cowboys cap, that's not to remind me that I'm a Cowboys fan. I know I'm a Cowboys fan. It's to let everybody else know where my allegiances are. And I think we got to be doing that with our kids. We got to be letting them think of creating way, creative ways to let them see our love for God, whether it's the Bible and devotional you use lying around the house, or maybe it's the worship music they hear. Maybe it's the way they see you living the fruit of the spirit in your relationships, or the way they see you actively engaged in the anchor cause at church and loving the forgotten and the ignored. What are some creative ways that they can see you loving God as hard as you can with all that you are and all that you have? Because if we're going to set up our kids for success, that's what it's going to be. It's going to be in as much as they catch and are taught from us how to love God as hard as they can with all that they are and all that they have. That's the biblical vision for what it means to be a parent, a caregiver, someone who's investing in the life of the next generation. And friends, honestly, that's not something we can do on our own. It is, just isn't. We live with this myth that the primary unit for raising up kids is a nuclear family of between two and five people. And that's an idea that was invented 75 years ago. For most of human history and for most of humanity around the world today, they don't live in nuclear families. They live in clans of 20 or 30 people who teach morals and preserve traditions and pass on values and protect the community from hardship and support in the midst of calamity. They, ra they raise their kids in community, which is why I love this next last verse in Deuteronomy 6, 9. It says, write these things on your house's door frames and on your city gates. The city gates are not just a door you enter to get into a city. It's where in the ancient world the community congregated, where business was transacted and politics was negotiated and justice was executed. In Israel, it was where the word of God was read and preached on, where people came together as a community of faith to say, we're going to be these people with and for each other. And friends, you need that. I need that in my parenting. In the next two weeks, we're going to talk about the role of the village in our parenting. But, but you can begin to access that right now. You have books and mommy blogs and parenting podcasts that you can tap into if you go to our Southridge website right now and click on Right Now Media, there are video parenting courses that our family ministry has set aside for you to do as a parent or as a family or with friends or, a, or a, your life group. Tap into relationships with your friends who are going through it with you, with family who's gone before you, with mentors that you respect. Tap someone on the shoulder and say, I love your parenting. Can I pick your brain? I love how your kids turned out. Can you help me invest in mine? Like draw the community in. But friends, at the end of the day, the biblical vision for parenting is not complicated. We set our kids up for success, to live in God's blessing, to have things go well for them and for them to experience the fullness and abundance of life in as much as they are able to have caught and be taught 
from us what it looks like to love God as hard as you can with all that you are and all that you have. That's it. That we're invited to love God into the next generation. And so I wonder what it would look like for us to revisit that exercise we did before the sermon, but to do it as we reflect on the ways that we're investing in the next generation as parents and caregivers, uncles and aunts, people who just love the next generation of kids. I wonder what it would be like to take some time this week and to spend some time reflecting on the ways that you are grateful for how you have been trying to love God into the next generation already, whether by instinct, by modeling, by teaching, by the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Where do you already see God's love, a love for God and God's love flowing through your parenting? And just celebrate that. And then to do the harder work of saying, where could my kids catch and be taught more of what it looks like to love God and love people in my life? Where do I need Jesus to shape me more by the Holy Spirit in that? And promise me this, if you do this exercise, Don't let it be this moment of heaping more guilt and shame on you, of raking yourself over the coals because you're the world's worst parent. We all think that about ourselves all the time, and it's not true. Do this in the presence of a God of grace who both loves you and forgives you for the ways that you've messed up, who is changing you and transforming you to love God, to love your kids, and to love people better every single day, and whose grace hovers over all that we do as parents. Come into the presence of a gracious, compassionate God and invite the Spirit to show you what it looks like to love God into those next generations of kids. Because that's what we've been invited to God to do, to love God as hard as we can, to love our kids as hard as we can, and then to pray as hard as we can. Let me pray for us as families and as generations this morning. Heavenly Father, who's the father of us all, Heavenly Father, who is a father of compassion and grace, whose son Jesus Christ was the child of Mary and grew up in a family and knows what families are like, whose son Jesus Christ died on the cross to draw the whole human family to himself in forgiveness and transformation and grace. Would you strengthen us for our daily life together in all of our joys And in all of our sorrows, let us experience the power of your presence. Bind us together and heal us, we pray, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.